At first glance, this bobbing, bubble-like creature looks like a jellyfish. But don't be fooled by its spindly tentacles and translucent body, because it's definitely not a jellyfish. This is a Portuguese man-o-war, and it's extremely dangerous. While it may seem like a harmless plastic bag floating in the ocean, it's not. If you come across one while swimming in the ocean or find one washed up on the beach, whatever you do, don't touch it. A Portuguese man of war can potentially kill a human, and you don't want to be its next victim. So if it's not a jellyfish, what is a Portuguese man of war? Do they only live in Portugal? The Portuguese man of war is a unique creature, and you know how much we love those. I mean, just look at it. Its weird appearance aside, something that makes this creature one of a kind is that it's not a single organism. It's a colony of organisms that work together to move, hunt, eat, and reproduce as a single unit. This type of creature is called a siphonophore. Four organisms make up each man of war, and they're called polyps. Though each polyp performs its task, they can only survive together. It's a tough world out there, and a single man of war polyp couldn't hack it on its own. Unlike jellyfish, these siphonophores don't propel themselves using their bodies. Instead, they drift along, and wind or ocean currents carry them. They've gathered in groups or legions of a thousand or more. Yikes! You won't catch me getting tangled in that deadly knot of tentacles. The Portuguese man of war received its strange name because its body resembles the sails of an 18th century Portuguese man of war battleship. And they're near Spain's beaches in the Mediterranean Sea, much to the dismay of locals and tourists. The reason beachgoers fear them is because of their long, stinging tentacles, which can grow up to 50.1 meters long. That's taller than the Arc de Triomphe. Their stingers are called nematocysts. Well, they're certainly my nematocysts. They can poison humans using their venomous bisalotoxin. They use their stinging tentacles to catch and immobilize small fish, shrimp, and plankton. Once they catch their prey, the polyp in charge of eating begins to digest it. If you have an unfortunate encounter with a Portuguese man of war tentacle, you will feel immediate and intense pain and develop severe skin welts. You may also experience fever, vomiting, and dizziness. And if you get exposed to enough venom, you could have cardiac, neurological, and respiratory distress. In an extreme case, it could kill you. In 1987, the first recorded death from a Portuguese man of war happened on a beach in Florida. A 67-year-old woman got stung while swimming in the ocean during the summer. That's when these creatures are fully mature and their venom is most potent. She was so severely stung that the stingers were still attached to her leg while medics treated her. The toxins eventually caused her to stop breathing and severely lowered her blood pressure. Unfortunately, she died. While Portuguese man of war deaths are rare, they do happen. So, if you see one, don't go anywhere near it, even if it's dead. Drifting along the ocean like a ship and having deadly tentacles is what Portuguese man o' wars do. This little worm might look like a cuddly underwater caterpillar, but let me warn you do not touch it. One sting from this unassuming sea creature will have you writhing in pain for hours. Imagine you're a scuba diver enjoying a morning swim, and then, bam, you get hit with a painful sting that quickly radiates up your arm, and the burning sensation is so intense, you think your arm might fall off. 
So how does a tiny worm deliver such a painful sting? Could it kill you? And you've got to see what this little worm does during mating season to believe it. This is a bearded fireworm. Typically spanning 5 to 10 centimeters in length, these unassuming tube-like creatures make their homes in the lush coral reefs of the Mid-Atlantic and Mediterranean waters. They enjoy a quiet lifestyle, spending their days hanging out on the muddy sea floor and minding their own business. They can even change their dark red color to better blend in with their surroundings and hide so they aren't disturbed. Until they feel threatened, that is. That's when the claws come out. Or should we say, their spikes. Because if you brush up against a fireworm, you will definitely feel its wrath and understand how it got its name. The white fuzz covering the fireworm's body is made of tiny, extremely sharp spikes filled with venom. And it's no ordinary venom either. It's a neurotoxin. And researchers think it's a chemical cocktail rather than just one strain of traditional venom. So when you brush up against a fireworm, its tiny, almost invisible spikes break off in your skin and release the toxins. Immediately, you'll feel like it's burning you, and the pain can last for hours. Thankfully, the toxins from a fireworm aren't strong enough to kill a person, but I still wouldn't recommend getting stung. Along with the whole burning skin and sharp splinters thing, it can cause dizziness, inflammation, and numbness. So it's just not a good time. The spikes aren't just for stinging unsuspecting scuba divers, though. They're also incredibly useful. The worms use their spikes to help them move, dig, and as a way to anchor themselves into their surroundings. Fireworms only puff up and become venomous when they feel threatened. But if you think it's bad to get stung by a fireworm, imagine being devoured by one. They don't live in coral reefs just because they like the view. They feed on the coral, too, and they don't do it gently. Did you know that coral reefs contain living animals inside the rocky exterior that we can see? Fireworms do. They eat their prey by wrapping their bodies along the reefs and biting off the tips of the shells. Then they suck out their prey's flesh, sometimes feeding in a single spot for upwards of 10 minutes. When they've had enough, they only leave a pointed tip on the coral. They also munch on shrimp, squid, and other crustaceans. And though they pack a mean punch, Fireworms aren't all bad. During the mating season, they're really quite romantic. Rather than hiding in the shadows like usual, the little worms swim to the surface in search of mates. That's when the show really starts. Fireworms are bioluminescent, lighting up their bodies to find one another in the water. The females create a green glow to attract the males, who show off in return with flashing light displays. All this and I can't even get a text back? Okay. Fireworms are a perfect example of why size doesn't always matter in the animal kingdom. Sometimes the tiniest creatures can do the most damage, just like fireworms do to us and coral reefs. They're seriously dangerous and put on light shows for their loved ones. That's what bearded fireworms do. It might not look like much, but if you see this in the forest, don't touch it. It can kill you in a matter of hours. To protect their spore-bearing blooms from predators, some fungi have evolved to bear lethal mushrooms. How do their toxins affect your body? And which is the most poisonous mushroom out there? You better chew mindfully. Here's our list of the five deadliest mushrooms. Number five, poison fire coral. This thin, red, finger-like mushroom is easy to mistake for the medicinal reishi mushroom. If you encounter it in the forests of Japan, Korea, or parts of Australia, don't touch it. The toxins in this mushroom can enter your body through your skin, not just by eating them. Symptoms like peeling skin, hair loss, and liver and kidney failure can take two weeks to show up. In larger doses, these toxins can kill brain cells and shrink parts of it in the process. Number four, autumn skullcap. Found everywhere throughout the Northern Hemisphere and down under in Australia, the autumn skullcap, or galarian mushroom, is brown or orangish brown in color with a thin umbrella-shaped top. It's often confused with the hallucinogenic psilocybin, 
but the effects are far from magical. You're in for a pretty rough spate of vomiting, diarrhea, and hypothermia within 12 hours of ingestion. After that, you might think you're okay, but the worst is yet to come. Amanitin, the autumn skullcap mushroom's toxin, will make its way through your digestive tract into your liver and blocks its ability to produce proteins. If you don't get medical attention quickly, this toxin could kill you in less than a day. Number three, destroying angel. Well, that sounds divine. This mushroom has earned its Hollywood blockbuster name from being the most toxic mushroom found in North America. It looks like a common white button or ink cap mushroom. Unfortunately, it also has the same toxin as the autumn skullcap, amatoxin. Cooking these mushrooms as a side to your bacon is not gonna make them any less poisonous. Symptoms like delirium, convulsions, and diarrhea could quickly become the beginning of the end for you. The amatoxin will shut down vital organs within 24 hours of ingestion. This mushroom kills 60 to 80% of people who eat it. Yikes. Number two, deadly webcap. The light brown colored deadly webcap grows across Europe. It has a picture-perfect umbrella shape with deep folds at the bottom and is very easy to mistake for several varieties of delicious edible mushrooms. And you'd almost think you got away with eating it too. The deadly webcap's poison, orelanin, can take anywhere between two days to three weeks before you even notice anything. Not only are you likely to have forgotten you ate those mushrooms during that time span, you're very likely not gonna suspect poisoning. Symptoms look very much like the flu. Left untreated, the toxin's effects can lead to severe kidney damage and death. Most survivors end up needing dialysis or a kidney transplant. And number one, death cap. Well, it's right there in the name. And at the top of our list of killer mushrooms is the death cap. Native to Europe, it's now found around the world. At first glance, the death cap is quite unremarkable. It's white and grows everywhere, from the sides of curbs in urban areas to logs in the forest. Not only is it easy to mistake for the edible straw or Caesar's mushrooms, it tastes just as good, which can be quite a problem. Rich in amatoxin, it takes less than half of one tiny mushroom to kill a 60 kilogram person. Initial symptoms can be flu-like, except in this case, within 12 hours, you would experience intense abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody diarrhea. Those are two words that should never go together. Your tissues lose fluids rapidly until your kidney, liver, and central nervous system shut down. Over half its victims fall into a coma and die. Not exactly a fun fungi. Damaging brain cells and attacking internal organs is what these poisonous mushrooms do. There is no way a rodent can defeat a leopard. Or is there? Ouch, that's gotta hurt. If you're thinking about the prickliest of rodents, the porcupine, then the answer is yes. Even though they don't throw their quills when threatened, your best bet is to stay away. So how dangerous is a porcupine? What are porcupine's quills made of? And why can they be useful to humans? When facing a predator, a porcupine will most likely swing its sharp quills around. They may not kill other animals, but those quills sure hurt. The most common porcupine species live in North America, where they sometimes crash parties at campgrounds and chew on canoe paddles. But other porcupines live in Africa, Europe, and Asia. Although they walk around heavily armed, porcupines are mostly harmless. Their bodies have soft hair, and the sharp quills on their backs, sides, and tails usually lie flat unless the porcupine feels threatened. Then they stand up to remind potential attackers that this animal is no easy meal. The quills detach when something touches them, and porcupines grow new quills to replace the lost ones. A typical North American porcupine may have over 30,000 quills. So if you ever see a porcupine, stay a safe distance of six meters away and do not disturb them. They can be fearless. 
Recent studies show that porcupines will use their quills to attack other animals, including leopards. And if a porcupine attacks you, you're in for a nasty experience. Getting spiked by a porcupine quill can be very painful, and removing them is not easy. The quills have barbs and scales that penetrate skin and help the quill lodge into the tissue very firmly. And if you try to pull them out, they tend to move inward. Clever. The deeper they penetrate, the more infection they can cause. The best advice is to get medical help to remove the quills and treat your wounds. But what happens if a porcupine accidentally stabs itself or another porcupine? Luckily, their quills have an antibiotic coating, but it only works on porcupines. That's pretty sneaky. And as for mating, they have a weird ritual. After winning a female's attention, the male sprays her from up to 1.8 meters away with his urine. When the female porcupine lowers her quills and moves her barbed tail to the side, the two can mate without hurting each other. But porcupine quills could help us. They're extremely resistant to buckling under pressure and could hold the secret to lighter, stronger materials. This could inspire future materials for buildings and vehicles. The quill's mix of shell, foam, and stiffeners could also help us design biologically inspired structures. According to researchers at the University of Toronto, the foam in quills helps them absorb energy and stay lightweight. If we could design medical needles and surgical staples with the same structure, they would be much smaller, require 56% less force to enter flesh, and likely cause less damage to our tissues. Having a body covered with sharp quills and using them to defeat predators is what porcupines do. And that's what makes them crazy creatures.